You know, we have Isaiah Saldivar coming. He's, you know, we're, he only really, he, he ministers in 12 churches um, throughout the year. That's it. He used to minister in churches all year long. Now he handpicks who he goes to. And he only goes to churches that are, like, that li- are like-minded, that are on fire, that believe, that believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're one of the churches, and we're so grateful that he's here. And God has used him, you know, amazingly. I just look at his YouTube, and he has over 135,000 um, followers. That's almost a million followers, subscribers on YouTube. And, and he, he, last year, he, uh, he had over 205 million views people looking at him and hearing his content and God is sending them here and I'll tell you why it's not only to get an impartation of worldwide ministry I really believe this that God has a great plan for your life and you haven't seen nothing yet there was 10 years that he was going from church to church pushing preaching to little kids and 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 youth groups and and going through it but God has something bigger and don't you think you've wasted your time Because God is working all of this out. And everything you've been going through is just training for where God is taking you. Come on. I've been going through some stuff, but it's been my training. And I'm getting ready. Come on. Is anybody getting ready for the best part of their lives? Come on. God is saying, I'm taking you to a better place. It's just preparation. So let's give Isaiah Saldivar a way world outreach welcome. And let him know you're happy and you're ready to receive from God today. And let's give Jesus, the most important person, a shout of praise. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our shout. This city needs a wild church. This city needs a radical church. This city needs a deliverance church. This city needs a miracle church. San Bernardino needs a revival church. A church on fire. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you, worship team. You guys are good. Thank you. You guys can sit down. Come on, how many of you came ready to go to war today? How many of you came ready to worship and praise like you've never praised before? Every time I come into the house of God, you can take your seat. And then when you feel it, stand, okay? You don't have to stand, but when you feel it, you can stand. How many of you know we're in a place where we're not some crusty, dusty, dead McDonald's, Burger King, have it your way, hometown buffet, a little smile, uh, Jesus. We're in a house of awakening and revival we are in a church where there is liberty to praise how you want to praise there is liberty to shout how oh, we got some tambourines we got some shofars up in here we're gonna blow those demons away we are in a place where the presence of god is welcome so don't come up in this house and try to give god a mamsy pamsy golf clap don't come acting like god is your favorite team that missed the playoffs our god never misses a beat our God is a God of power a God of authority a God of life and so I'm gonna praise him he is worthy of my shout he is worthy of my praise see some of you don't need a new Bethel song come on now some of you don't need a new Hillsong song to sing to. You need a flashback of all that God has brought you out of. You need a flashback. I remember a time where I was an atheist and I couldn't praise. I remember a time I was addicted and I couldn't shout. I remember a time where I was in such bondage and had chains on. I had no song to sing, but now I'm in the house of God. Every chain come on help me in this as much as you can every chain has been broken every shackle has been broken and i came to put the spirit of fear on notice fears afraid today we're given the spirit of anxiety anxiety in this room the lord says no demon is safe in this house See, many of you are visiting and you've been to a lot of churches where demons are comfortable in the church. You've been to a lot of churches where you walk in dysfunctional and you walk out dysfunctional. You've been to a lot of churches where you walk in filthy and walk out filthy. Solomon saw a peculiar thing. He said people walk in the temple one way and they leave the same way. He saw them walking in depressed and leaving depressed. Walking in addicted and leaving in addicted. I am so grateful that we are in a place today where the atmosphere 
atmosphere of the Holy Spirit is moving, where the power and the fire and the anointing of God is moving, where you have a pastor that believes in freedom, believes in miracles, believes in revival, believes in the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Are you glad you're in a place where you have pastors that still believe that marriage is between one man and one woman? How many of you are glad you're in a place where your pastor's not afraid of driving out demons? How many of you are glad you're in a place? Some of you right now are being healed by the miracle power of God. We are in an atmosphere of miracles. We are in a season of harvest. I'm excited about that. Hey, listen, some of y'all might need to relocate in this house. There might be someone in your row that's ruining your flow. I don't care if you have to find a new chair. I don't care if you're, oh, I brought my boyfriend. What is he going to think of me? I don't care what my boyfriend thinks, what my girlfriend thinks, what my in-law thinks, what my wife thinks. I'm today going to be undignified. I'm going to praise undignified. I'm going to respond undignified. I'm going to shout undignified. I used to party with some of y'all. You were wild, undignified, doing keg stands. We have all these soft guys in the church. I don't know, brother, it doesn't take all that. I'm like, you weren't saying that when you were at the club. You weren't saying that at the bar, it's just so loud. You were in front of the subwoofer, ladies. Your hair was, the, the hairspray was being blown off your hair by the subwoofers at the club. And nobody was tapping the DJ on the shoulder saying, it's just a little bit too loud in here just a little bit too much. It don't take all that. It's crazy the way you used to move your body for bail. It's crazy the sacrifices you made for Moloch. It's crazy the way you used to worship and serve Delilah and Jezebel. But now we're in the house of God and we're living in a church era of soft. We're living with people in the church that are soft. I came to give the devil a migraine. The devil's been giving me a migraine, messing with my family. I came to torment the spirit of anxiety. I came to torment the spirit of suicide. Suicide. There ain't no demon in this room that's safe. We're casting all y'all out. You heard me. We're not, we're not playing patty cake. There is an unseen battle happening right now in your life. There is an invisible war. See, Colossians 1.18 talks about how God made the visible realm and the invisible realm. And the invisible realm with dominions and thrones and rulers and powers and principalities and kings. The invisible realm, the rulers of the unseen world, they are dictating what's happening in our seen world. And so we're not battling things in the natural. Ephesians 6 says our battle is not flesh and blood. We're not fighting against persons with bodies, but against persons without bodies. We are fighting against unseen realities, unseen powers, and unseen rulers. We are not going to war against the people of the city. We are going to war against the spirits that keep the people in bondage. If we want to see a harvest, we need some Moseses to rise up. Look that demonic Pharaoh in the eye and say, let my family go. Let my marriage go. Let my body go. Let this city go. We are challenging powers and principalities we travel and cast out demons and so many demons speak out we hate you we don't want you here what are you doing what do you want from us we know who you are i was in north carolina demons spoke out started telling me all the stuff about me kids names we know who you are we're going to destroy this we're going to destroy that you should be on hell's hit list you should give the devil a fever you should get out of bed in the morning and say oh no he woke up early today we got to go you should have you should be pushing back see a lot of people aren't fighting against the kingdom of darkness. They're fighting for the kingdom of darkness. God is raising up warriors in this hour. This church is not a pacifier church. This is not a life support church. This is not a survival church. This is a revival church. We are thriving. God is going to take you off of life support. You're going to be so full of the Holy Ghost. After today, the overflow is going to get on people. The leftovers are going to bring somebody out of a wheelchair. They're going to be so full of the Holy Ghost, you won't even want to watch no football game. Some of you men, listen, I get it. You don't understand why I praise this way. I don't understand the way you praise the way you praise. 
See, you see me praise at this altar. You see some of these young men and young ladies. It confuses you why anybody would be that excited about someone, something or someone. Yet I watch some of you today at the playoff games. You will be shouting. You will be screaming. And they already told me, don't say nothing about the 49ers or they're going to slash your tire. I, listen, I don't want to lose any subscribers. So I get it. Listen, but we could say this. Some of you are going to shout. You're going to scream. Some of you are going to be in front of your television trying to block the field goal. I saw this growing up with family members. I'm like, this dude's in front of the television. I don't know if he knows they can't hear him. I think he thinks he's coaching them through the TV. My uncle used to stand when they were trying to block a field goal. My uncle would stand up in front of the TV and pretend he was there. He'd be like, everybody get up. We're going to block this field goal. And he thought somehow by all of us doing that. And I was like, whoa, it's weird. I see him with his hands up in front of the TV, but never seen him with his hands up in church. It's weird he's in front of a television pretending to block a field goal with his hands up, but when's the last time your children have seen dad that passionate, that excited, and that radical? We are not talking about some 49er interception to bring y'all to the playoffs. We are talking about the God that intercepted every strategy, every plan, everything the devil had planned, God intercepted. I think he's a little worthy of our, what do y'all think? I'm just making sure we're we're not at St. Anthony's. I think he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our shout. You guys are too loud. You ain't seen nothing yet because in 2024, this house is being launched into a new dimension in the spirit. In 2024, the harvest is here. More passion. More. I told him, bring me my rag when I'm preaching good. More hunger, more fire, more filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm praying. I have nothing against, by the way, I know you guys are like, he must hate sports. I don't hate sports. I just don't know why you're more passionate about that than God. I just don't understand why our prayer meetings are 95% women. And they're like, my husband didn't want to come. He's too busy watching another UFC fight, thinking the war is in the octagon. The war is not in the octagon. The war is in the prayer room. And God is raising up men that are going to take their rightful place. Stop letting your wife lead you. Stop letting your wife have to pray for your kids. Every one of you men should be laying hands on your kids. Cast those devils out of your kids. Pray the Holy Ghost to fill them. Pray that God would heal them it's time to man up and and listen i'm trying to move on but god's just saying say it isaiah i know you got it in you i seen you at the tailgate I know, I just don't know, the service is so long, yet you are four hours early so you can get to the parking lot to get your favorite spot to cook some carne asada, yet you can't show up for an hour and a half on Sunday and give God everything. Stop saying you're too busy when all you're telling me is you're passionate. It's just not about the things of God. The God that I'm here preaching about, he is the only one worthy of everything. He's the only one worthy of my time. He's the only one worthy. I'm not preaching about some religious God. I'm talking about the radical God going into now I could tell by some of your face you don't realize we're in the last days. I don't have 30 minutes to tell you all the news headlines of all the demonic perversion going on in Hollywood, all the demonic perversion going on in television, all the demonic perversion, all the political agendas. I can't tell you the underbelly of what's going on right now. Behind the scenes, the devil is planning, plotting. The devil has no shame. This is one thing the Lord spoke to me. He said, Isaiah, why is it the devil's shameless? If you want, I was, on, I was watching the other day the news, I don't know, it was a couple months ago, and it was at the White House. And I'm like, oh, look, there's a little thing going on at the White House. And on the television, I know I'll get canceled for saying this. Cancel me. I don't care. On the television, we had the president speaking, which I don't want to go into that. But we had the president speaking. And then they panned the camera. And they were celebrating. There was men that were identifying or dressed as women. But they were actually men. And they were flashing the camera on television as if it was some holy thing. And they were like, yeah, right. You know, free the nipple, whatever. And these were men dressed as women flashing the television. And and the world is saying, yes, look at the freedom. Look at the liberty. See, here's what I want to show you. We are living in a generation that calls bondage, perversion, and deception liberation and calls liberation crazy. But God is rewriting history. God is washing this nation. I believe that America still has hope. There is a chance for revival and the spirit of perversion is 
is being broken off the church. The spirit of lust is being broken off the church. These signs are signs of the last day. And I look at the way we live our lives, the way we talk to our family, the way we choose to spend our time. We don't realize we're living in the last days. See, this is what Paul said. He said, wake up out of your slumber. This was 2,000 years ago. Now is the high time to wake up. He says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. And this is what Paul says. Our salvation is nearer than we first believed. See, you think you have time. You think, oh, I'm going to have time. I'm going to be this. And in a few years, I'll be radical. And some of you in this room are like, I would never take the mark of the beast. When the Antichrist comes, I'll never take the mark. And I'm telling you right now, if you can't stand for God right now, if you're not bold for God right now, you're definitely taking the mark of the beast. Come on, help me. If you're not radical now, God, send me to China. I'm like, you can't even witness that Panda Express. Like, send me to China, China and Africa. I'm like, Africa, how about go witness at the park? What you talking about, Africa? You never even shared your faith with your neighbors. You're at your little Starbucks Bible study, and you're like, God, send me to run deliverance. And I'm going like, what do you mean cast? How are you going to cast a demon out of them if you won't even deal with the own demons in your life? You're over there feeding your demon snacks every night and then saying, I don't know why God's not using me. And God's like, I know why. Because you don't even have your act together. You're full of the world, the culture, and yourself. There's no room for the Holy Ghost. God, I want you to fill me today. And God goes, where? You're busy Monday, you're busy Tuesday, you're busy Wednesday, you're busy Thursday, you're hungover Friday, you're hungover Saturday. You come over and give me a little leftover 90-minute worship, 90-minute praise. You give everybody else the best of you and me the rest of you. You let everybody else use you but me. I'm dropping one-liners if y'all have Twitter. Go ahead and, I don't even have a Twitter, so go ahead. Or X, is it called? I forget. I think they killed the bird. It's called X. But you can drop these one-liners. God says you give everybody else. Why is it that God gets leftovers in the church? This is what this is all about. If we're going to see a harvest, if we're going to go to the next dimension in God, I love what pastor said earlier in the office. He said, Isaiah, of course this year is going to be better. We go from glory to glory. God doesn't take us back. We take us back. God says, I want to launch you into another level. I want to launch. I'm here today ready to go to the glory. I'm ready for my next glory. I'm ready for my spiritual promotion. You wear the demons out. Tell your chief to come out. I'm ready to fight every demon. Tell the commander to come out. I'm not afraid of you, devil. You ought to get some boldness in you and say devil get your hands off my children get your hands off this generation I'm a last day warrior God's releasing the warrior spirit warriors aren't calm warriors and I know it's not for me maybe you're not a warrior Maybe you're just not called to be a warrior. Maybe you're not. You know, there's guys that do these sermon reviews of me, and they take my sermons, and they don't believe in gifts or spiritual anything. They're just dry as last year's bird's nest. They're drier than cracker juice. And they do my sermon reviews, and they're like, they always get mad when I say spiritual snipers, spiritual Navy SEAL. I love the, the military talk. I'm the warrior out here. I'm not playing patty cake, kumbaya. Ain't no daisy ground wearing over here. Ain't no weird sus stuff going on. I know a lot of the pastors out here, we don't know what they are, where they are. Well, Some of the pastors, I'm like, is that the pastor? his wife's outfit he's wearing. I mean, I don't know what's going out here in the church. We got a lot of pastors that spend more time on their hair than in prayer. We got a lot of pastors that, you know, jeans getting a little skinnier and skinnier. I'm like, you're wearing those. Anyways, 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 here we go. Here we go. We need some leaders that are going to be warriors. I believe God is releasing the warrior spirit. God is raising up fighters. Come on, you got to get a little bit Hispanic in you. I'm Hispanic. God is raising up some fighters. God is raising, I'm not taking no for an answer. Devil, you ain't telling me what to do. I'm telling you what to do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Get bold. Listen, I might be 140 pounds soaking wet in the natural. I'm 220 in the spirit. I had this guy who was a UFC fighter that traveled with me. And uh, he said, man, you're real skinny in the natural, but you're strong in the spirit. He said, I would say you're about 220 in the spirit. I said, brother, I don't know what I am. I just know that I'm armed and dangerous, ready for battle, and I'm putting on the armor of light. Remember, Jesus is looking for laborers, warriors, workers. We want to blame the world. The world is dark. I don't have time to go into it because I have a message. The world is dark. 
we are inevitably, no doubt, undisputable, no arguing. This is not subjective. This is objective. We're in the last days. Ladies and gentlemen, if I don't have to tell you the headlines, the tabloids, what's going on, we are living in the last days of human history. John said we're in the final moments. If John said 2,000 years ago we're in the final moments, I believe we are in the final seconds. This is where God is preparing his church. God, by the way, does not have a plan B. I know some of you are like, well, if the whole being a church doesn't work out and the whole Christian thing, and maybe God will find God's plan for the world is the church. God's plan for humanity is a church on fire, is a church full of the Holy Ghost, is a church that is passionate, is a church that is radical, is a church that shouts louder and is more excited over his presence than over a football game. I'm not going to shout louder over grand men, men running on a grass and tight pants chasing a pigskin than I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm not talking about the lions. I'm talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah. I'm not talking about getting my information from CNN, ABC, or Fox News. I'm talking about my information comes from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm talking about being an end time warrior. So we can blame the world. And we like doing that. We love getting up and saying how wicked the world is. And they are wicked. The Bible says the entire world is under the power of the devil. If you didn't know, spoiler alert, the devil is the ruler of this world. Jesus said the ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. The goal is not to try to escape from, you know, being in this world and get on a, a spaceship and go with Elon Musk to Mars to try to start a church because you don't want to be under the devil's power. The goal is to make sure the ruler of this world has nothing in you. See, the devil wants to plant seeds in your life. And what gave Jesus so much power and authority not only of course he was sinless but Jesus had nothing in common with darkness he said the ruler of this world is coming but he has nothing in me I wonder if we can sit in this building and say the devil's got nothing in me no arrogance, no doubt, no pride, no lust, no perversion, nothing in my life, no anger. I'm living that Christian life, and me and the devil have nothing in common, but we have an issue. The issue is we're trying to cast out something that entertains us. I don't know why I can't cast out demons, because demons entertain you, because you find your value and your worth on TikTok, on Instagram, on social media, and what we've done is we've replaced our relationship with Jesus with a relationship with social media, Instagram, TikTok. Talk, and we think because we watch influencers and we listen to podcasts that we somehow know God. But all you're listening to is another man's relationship and another man's revelation. And God is saying, come up here, Jeremiah. Come up here, Ezekiel. I want to show you great and mysterious things that you do not know. Push away from the table of distraction and come sit at the table of the Lamb. Listen, if I was in this city, I'd be in this church. This is not a church that plays game. Your pastor is not a pastor that's playing game. He is a wartime general. There are wartime generals in army in, the, in times of war, and there are peacetime generals. The peacetime generals are in charge when there's no war happening. The wartime generals take over when war breaks out. We don't need peacetime warriors. We don't need peacetime generals. We need pastors that are wartime generals. We recognize there's a war going on, and we're going to fight for this generation, and we're going to go down swinging if we have to. But here's what's happened. We've replaced our relationship with God with a relationship with social media, thinking we still have a relationship with God, and we've lost our true relationship with a God that didn't make him, himself in our image, but made us in his image. See, our generation, if we don't like something, we crop it, we edit it, and we put a filter on it. Truth be told, some of y'all come up to me to meet me, I have, and I know what you look like on social media, but I don't even recognize you in person. It's like, hi, I'm so... All right, I had this one lady who I know, and I see your Facebook, and I, and, you know, she comments on my stuff, and she came to meet me, and I was like, girl, you put your picture from high school up on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not even being rude. She was in her mid-70s. She's like, it's me, Lydia. I'm like, are you Lydia's grandma, great-grandma? <laughs> see, why? Because she was able to make herself look how she ever wanted to look. We edit and crop it. Some of you ladies, I already know your eyes aren't in that color. Your eyes aren't hazel, they're poop brown. Let's just be honest. And you even have that crown filter. You forgot to edit out the crown that goes on the filter with the, y'all you know what I'm talking about? Your eyes are, and your makeup's all done and then you take the filter off. I'm like, that ain't you. This is what we do in our generation. If we don't like something, we put a filter on it. If we don't want, we'll just crop it out. 
Chin's a little long there, a little too much down here. Ears a little floppy out here. We're just gonna edit, Photoshop, crop it out, hit that on cap cut, add some filters, put some clarity on there, brighten up those dark eyes because I haven't slept in a week and we're good to go. The problem is that mentality gets translated into the Bible and now we put filters on what God tells us. We edit out deliverance. We have edited out, cropped out deliverance, cropped out miracles, cropped out speaking in tongues, edited out repentance edited out going all the way in and I came to tell you oh, what if the new people get offended or what if they see deliverance, miracles and revival and they actually believe that God is real they actually believe that God is alive how many of you are tired of being fake a lot of us have a photoshopped relationship with God we don't pray we don't have to raise our hand for this we don't pray we don't read, we don't fast, we don't know God. This is the epidemic in America is we have a church age where we don't know God. And instead of recognizing that we're not laborers, we're lazy, we blame the harvest. But when Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, here's what you need to understand. He didn't put the blame on the world. He said, the world's ready for y'all. San Bernardino, they are ready, ripe and ready. He said, here's where the problem lies. The problem lies is the harvesters, the, the workers are few. He said, there's just a lot of people that just want to be there that just want to sit around but God is saying in 2024 there's no more spectating for you this is not a cruise ship this is a battleship there's no more playing games with God some of you have been sitting in the very back getting away with it but God is drafting you to the front lines God is not looking for cheerleaders he's looking for someone to get on the field God is not looking for spectators he's looking for participants and I really believe the Lord is saying stop blaming the world for being the world and start being the church the harvest is is ready when is my family ready right now you know many of us in this room we want our friends and family saved we want them in revival we want them awakened but we don't witness to them we don't pray for them we don't do anything and we expect God to do all the work and God said I've already given you the Holy Spirit I've already given you the power he's not the doer he's the helper and he's helping you he's helping you pray he's helping you fast he's helping you evangelize we need to break out of the spirit of lazy we need to stop being ashamed if the devil is not ashamed of flashing us on television then we need to stop being afraid of exposing this world to the glory of God. I believe it is time for the church to come out of the closet and be bold about their faith. It's time to break out of shame. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. The devil's bold. When's the church going to be bold? And you know what I realized about the devil? He doesn't apologize. He doesn't wreck your marriage and say, by the way, I'm, so, I'm real sorry about what I did to your husband. I know I had him on drugs for 12 years. I just want to come send you a nice apology. Are we good? The devil is not apologizing for addicting your kids. He's not apologizing for sexualizing your teenage daughters. He's not apologizing for demasculizing your, your, your teenage boys. He's not apologizing for ruining your marriage. He's not apologizing for ruining your mind, for talking to you, for wanting to still kill and destroy from you. So why is it the church has to always apologize? Oh, we're sorry. I know people are getting delivered at the altar and you're new. And we're really sorry about that. Next time we'll bring it to the back room. Hey, we're real sorry that the guest pastor preached about, you know, hell and repentance. And at our church, we just believe everybody goes to heaven because we're woke and we're inclusive and we're this and we're that. And I don't know, some of them are gay, honestly. And so we're just anybody, all this. I mean, pastors get, and, and there's, there's, no, there's no line. There's no standard. There's no level of holiness. There's no preaching of the word of God it's like you can do anything and then if we if we preach the word we have to apologize after stop apologizing for what Jesus said is right and what Jesus said is wrong I had one pastor I'm done and then I, I got a quick 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 word pastors like yeah, you know, I preached as hard as I could preach. This was years ago. I mean, I laid it all out, my testimony. And my whole sermon was like, you got to go all in. You're not a Christian if you're not all in. You don't, God doesn't want 99.9%. And it was crazy. The whole youth group was up crying. This was like probably six or seven years ago. They were at the altar crying. It was an incredible breakthrough. So I got done and I was like, I'm going to go lay hands. And I gave him the mic and he got up there and said, you know, Isaiah didn't really mean everything. And Jesus didn't really mean everything. And for some of you, I know it's hard for you to hear. I'm sorry. And I got back up after him later. I said, no, I did mean all of that. 
I meant everything. I meant the video games, the music, the movie, the porn, the alcohol, the vaping, the drinking, the nicotine. I don't care if you put the patch in your top lip or your bottom lip, wherever you put the pouch, if you swallow, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wicked, come out from among them, walk in holiness. I meant go all in. The Greek means it, I meant it. In Hebrew, it means everything. Jesus said, give me everything. But because we don't give him anything, we've lost his presence in our life. This was the number one issue when Jesus came to the earth the first time, and it will be the number one issue when he comes the second time. And the issue was there was no room for Jesus in the people's lives. The Bible says he came to the inn, and the inn said, sorry, we don't have room for him to be born. And Jesus says, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? In other words, when he came once, there was no room for him. Will he come back and find a church that is so busy with every program, picnic, party, and outreach, more worried about the air condition than the prayer condition, pastors more worried about their hair than prayer will he find a church that is so full of people but not filled with the holy spirit see we're not trying to fill a building we're trying to fill you with the power of the holy ghost and the fire of the holy ghost and jesus says will i find faith when i come back or will you say today i'm too busy for you in 2024 i'm praying that you'd get a holy addiction with god where he's the only thing that matters I'm not being arrogant or proud. Jared here is one of my best friends. We drove here six plus hours. The entire drive, we were talking about God. We didn't put music on at all. There was no music on for six plus hours. And we sat there talking about ministry, talking about God, talking about prayer. And then we got to the hotel. We started praying in the spirit. Jared fell asleep praying in the spirit. I was up studying late. He woke up at like, I don't know, four or five in the morning. I woke up to him praying in the spirit. We had worship music on, praying in the spirit. We got in the car, come over here. I put on that one song, the chain breakers in the room. We blasted that. We are praying in the Holy Ghost. Why? It's, it's everything. It's every waking moment. We don't turn it on. We don't turn it off. Your pastor is the same guy in the green room as he is on the stage. He's a man of holiness and a man of prayer. And this church, God says, this church will be a church that isn't just on fire on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Do I have anybody to help me preach in here? Are we in the right house? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. In the morning, I pray. In the afternoon, I pray. At night, I pray. While I'm eating, it's all about God. We're obsessed. We're obsessed with this God. What else matters? God is raising up men that are going to fight harder for him than they are going to fight and shout and scream for their favorite football game, their favorite boxing game. I do believe God's going to start removing your appetite for the things of this world. I do believe, and I feel bad. I'm sorry. I know you're like, I just thought I was going to be a guest speaker. He was going to be nice. I'm sorry if I don't get invited back. This service was why. But I'm telling you, God's going to remove and rip out every desire, and they're not even sinful desires. They're not even wrong desires. It's just the weight that's holding you down. The Bible says throw off the sin and the weight so you can run the race with endurance that has been set before you. God, strip off the weight. Strip off the desires. I need your presence because I don't want to lose God. This is the travesty of the church. We have an entire church generation where God is not in his own church. The book of Revelation, he gives seven prophetic rebukes to seven churches. And at the end, he says, behold, I stand outside the door and knock. And if anyone will open, he'll, I'll come in and dine with him. And a lot of well-meaning, amazing pastors, they say, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. And if you'll invite him in, he'll come build a treehouse in your heart. And we preach that over and over. That is not at all what the Bible says. He's not knocking on the door of the heart. He was knocking on the door of his own church. They were at a time where Jesus was outside his own church. And they were in there worshiping praising, singing, and dancing, but they didn't have Jesus. Let me tell you that you can be in this room, and you can come to service on Sunday, and you can sing the songs, and you can pray the prayers, and you can jump when we jump, and give when we give, and go home, and not have Jesus in your life. There are many Christians that will meet Jesus for the first time on Judgment Day, and you're going to stand before God, and Jesus is going to look at you on Judgment Day. He's the mediator between you and the Father. And the Father's going to say, I don't know this person. And Jesus is going to look at you. And the Bible says, because you've denied him on earth. This is what your Bible says. I know you don't like this. Take it up with the word of God. Jesus says, because you've denied me on earth. Because you never opened your mouth. You wanted nothing to do with me. You were ashamed of me. You were embarrassed of me. You hated my presence. 
You never prayed. You don't love his presence. Guys, if we never pray outside of church, we don't love the presence of God. Honey, I love you. I just don't want to ever spend time with you. My wife would say, you don't truly love me then. My wife would say, why is it, Isaiah, the only time you want to talk to me is for 90 minutes on Sunday, and then all you're doing is asking me for things. What kind of relationship is that? That's where we're at in the American church with God. God says, you don't love me, and you're going to be on judgment right there, and the Father's going to say, I have no clue who this person is. Jesus, do you know them? And Jesus, the Bible said, this is what your word says, Jesus will look, and because you denied him all of these years, because you lived a life void of the person of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit, the God of the universe that lives in, because you lived your life distracted, uninterested, un could care less, just show up and throw money in a plate, Jesus is going to look at you and go, and you're going to sit there going, oh yeah, of course, Jesus knows me. I know you, Jesus. I went to church. I prayed to you. I invite you in my heart like 90 times. I mean, every time I drank after, I'd invite you in my heart, sleep around, invite you in my heart. I mean, you came in my heart, bro. You were in my heart all the time, every day, before bed, just, and Jesus didn't go, no, I don't know him. And the Bible says you will be thrown into a place of everlasting torment where the worm dies not. And do you know the Bible says when you get thrown into hell, you will actually see heaven? The Bible says you will see heaven and you will see the prophets and all the men of great, all the men from the Bible, you will see them as you're grabbed by an angel, as you're thrown into hell, you will literally be cast out of heaven seeing everything you missed out on for all of eternity because you decided to worship the gods of this world, to worship the gods of this culture and to live your life completely ignoring Jesus. And I know what you're thinking, Isaiah, how would I possibly not have Jesus? How would I possibly have lost lost Jesus. There is an interesting story, I won't go long on it, in Luke chapter 2, where the parents of Jesus, now I read this story and I go, what would it be like to be Jesus' parents? I mean, imagine Jesus doesn't clean his room, and Mary's like, hey, Joseph, um, Jesus didn't clean his room. I mean, and jo Joseph's like, I'm not spanking God. I mean, this, they, guys, gee, think about how humble Jesus was. He subjected himself fully God fully man subjected himself to a womb for nine months. God was inside of a womb for nine months, chilling in a womb, was born of a virgin, didn't even start ministry for 30 years, humbled himself like a man, gave up his divine privileges, and walked among us, and he had real parents. And I'm reading this in Luke 2, where literally the Bible says they took Jesus, Mary and Joseph, to Jerusalem for Passover, and they had a great celebration. Jesus was 12 years old, and the Bible says after the celebration, they realized they lost Jesus. So here's what's interesting about the story is they didn't lose Jesus at the church. They didn't lose Jesus at the celebration. Sometimes we get so caught up in the celebration, we don't realize who the celebration is about. We are not here for Isaiah Saldivar. I'm sorry if you came. Take your picture now. There's your cheesy smile. You can clip it on. You didn't come for Isaiah Saldivar. Likely, I will not lay hands on most of you. I will pray for some of you. You didn't come for a man. See, we get so caught up in coming for the great speaker, coming for the great sermon. We realize the celebration really wasn't about that. The celebration was about the last lamb. The celebration was about the last Adam. The celebration is the Passover in Exodus was great, but there is going to be another Passover, and the blood of this lamb will be shed for all all the sins of the world. Mary and Joseph, you had one job. Don't lose God. And you lost God. You lost God. I look at some of you, now I don't have glasses on, so you all look like SpongeBob to me. I can't even tell who's who. Color, female, male, I have no clue. I don't know clue of you or your wife when I look at you. It's just, it's nothing. It's all blur. Here's what I want to tell you. Some of you have lost God. I look around this crowd and the, the saddest part is not, let's get them to give and get them in a blessing and preach a nice, you know, I know what you want. You want a nice sermon that's going to get the chill bumps going down your spine and a good revelation. If it just hits right, maybe then I'll say yes to God if he says the right words. But here's what I want to say to you. Don't you miss God? Don't you miss, don't you miss him? Don't you, don't you remember the time where you used to be the first person at the altar and you were on your face and you were in his presence? And I'm talking about when you came out of rehab before you got the new job, before you got married, before you had kids, before you had to work that overtime to pay for the interest rate you couldn't afford, to buy the boat you couldn't afford. And now Pastor Marco was your best friend. He was on, he was your wallpaper. You showed everybody. Everything was about the way world outreach and my church is the best church. And now we don't see you. Now you don't show up. And uh, 
You're here maybe once every few weeks and you don't show up to Wednesday. Why? Because I got to work now. And, and I'm just wondering if you miss God. I'm wondering if you can think back to a moment of your life where his presence was so real. Now, Mary and Joseph, it's about a day and a half journey where they lived to where Jesus was in Jerusalem. And the Bible says they realized that he was missing. See, the Bible says they didn't recognize him at first. They, rec they didn't recognize they lost him at first. Again, the problem wasn't do you praise in church. The problem is after the celebration, do you praise? The problem isn't do you worship in church. The problem is after the celebration, do you worship at home? The problem isn't do you come and pray at the altar. The problem is you don't have a prayer life in your home and your kids don't see you praying. Your kids don't see you reading because you left Jesus at the church. And Jesus says, I don't want to stay in Jerusalem. I don't want to stay at the temple. I want to go home with you. I want to. See, you don't miss Jesus at first. Here's what happens when you lose God is you start replacing the void God filled with other things. So God used to be the only one that gave me joy, but now the vape's gonna be the thing that brings me joy. God be, he was the only one that gave me pleasure, but now the fornication is the thing that has given me pleasure. God is the only thing that made it so I wasn't bored, but now my hobbies, my interests, and TikTok are going to make me where I'm not bored. And so what happens is these idols in our life begin to take the place of God, and it's a slow fade. You don't notice it at first. See, the Bible says that Samson lost the presence of God and did not even realize it. We don't preach this in the church anymore. Most pastors won't preach on the fear of God. Most pastors won't tell you that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Most pastors won't tell you that you can quench the Holy Spirit. Some of you in this room, you have wounded God. You have abused God. You have neglected God. You have hurt God. And it's no wonder his presence has strayed from you. Now, the presence of God is everywhere. God will never leave you in that sense. But his manifest presence is not everywhere. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're hearing God, doesn't mean you're passionate about God, doesn't mean you're on fire for God. Paul gives us two categories. He said there's one category. Yes, you're saved. He says, but you're barely saved. He says there will be one group of people that will barely escape the flames of judgment because they did nothing for God and they have no eternal reward. And then there's another category that will be literally rich on judgment day, that will be bold on judgment day. I am not trying to sneak through the back door of heaven. The Bible says that those that are righteous will get a grand entrance into the kingdom of God. You ought to expect that when you get there, there will be a banner with your name on the gates. There will be a celebration and a parade because a grand entrance is for those that know Jesus. I'm not trying to be a barely Christian in 2024. So the Bible says they realize it. They have two choices. We're almost done. Choice number one, they can do what many of us do. Mary and Joseph, it's extremely embarrassing to say we've lost God. It's extremely embarrassing to say we don't have Jesus anymore. And we've been telling these people all this time that this is God, the one that's going to take away the sins of the world. And now we have to tell these people how we lost God. You know what the people's response would have been? How could you lose something so important? You're telling me this is the son of God. You, Mary and Joseph, y'all been preaching this. You told me, no, we're clean, the Holy Spirit. You want us to believe that? And now you're telling me the most important thing in the world, you've lost him for for what? For distraction? For, for the journey? And here's why. I get it. The journey of life gets so busy and so hectic and so wild. This message today is not a message of judgment. This is a message of love and grace saying Jesus wants you back. Jesus misses you. Jesus is tired of you leaving him. So choice one is we go on business as usual and maybe nobody will notice he's gone. Maybe my wife won't notice that I've lost the presence of God in my life. Maybe the kids won't notice that we don't show up to prayer anymore. Maybe the kids won't notice that we're no longer involved in the church and the youth ministry and the homeless outreach and the men's home. Maybe the kids won't notice. Honey, maybe we can just keep pretending like we're on fire. Maybe if we post enough scriptures on Instagram, maybe if we post testimonies from 17 years ago, maybe if we like enough, and maybe if we pick enough pictures of our fake highlighted Bible. Some of you ladies, come on, be honest, you ain't highlighting that much. You're highlighting it, then taking the picture, and then you don't even know what you highlighted. I'm like, you just highlighted the book of Leviticus, sweetie. Did you know what you highlighted? We're, we're so busy putting on a show for people 
And maybe if I post enough Instagram, maybe if I share enough reels, maybe if I share enough chosen videos and I let everyone know I watch season four in theaters, maybe they won't know I've lost Jesus. Honey, maybe we can just go on and, and just act like he's in our life still and we'll pretend, but you know when you lay he your head on your pillow, you've lost Jesus. Look at me. You know at night when you don't have that sweet touch of his presence. You know when you're up with anxiety and insomnia and anxiety and fear and suicide. You know that there was a, mo a time where you didn't have all these issues, where the presence of God sustained you, where you didn't need pills, you didn't need Vicodin, you didn't need Oxy, you didn't need a drink, you didn't need alcohol, you didn't need a white claw, you didn't need a glass of Jack. I just need one glass of wine. It helps my stomach. So does not eating out all the time. I mean, we're using all these excuses to justify our compromise, but what if we had Jesus? What if we said, I don't need to go on sabbatical and take a vacation. Jesus is my vacation. Jesus is my refuge. I don't need a glass of wine to calm me down. The Holy Ghost, he calms me down. He washes me. He cleanses. Y'all ain't ready. Or, number two, we could humble ourselves and say, we have to admit something. We've lost God. Honey, you're going to see me come to the altar th this morning, and I'm not going up there for somebody else. I'm going up there because I've lost God. I'm going to walk up there because I've lost God, and I'm not leaving this house without him again. I've left every Sunday of 2023 and left him in church. Praise God for Jesus. Yay. And I leave him at the altar, and I walk away, and I ignore him all week long, and then I come back and say, how are you, Jesus? Can you give me more stuff this week? And God, and they, they decided, Mary and Joseph, thank God, they decided we're going to find Jesus. And the Bible says they begin to look for Jesus among the, follow, the, the traveling followers. Now, you might think, well, how would you lose him? Here's what we got to realize in those days. In those days, the women and children did not travel together. The men traveled in front of the women and the women traveled behind with the kids. And the men were called in those days to lead the women. But sadly, in this generation, the women and children are leading the men. But I praise God that we have godly men that say, I'm going to be the one doing early morning Bible studies with my kids every day. I'm going to be the one laying hands on my daughters every night praying they get full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be the example your kids need you man so here's what happened mary probably assumed that jesus was with joseph and joseph probably assumed that jesus was with mary stop assuming because your wife has jesus you're okay stop it well my wife's on fire but you're dead well, my husband's radical, but you're not. You both need to be. So when they realize that, then they realize and they start frantically looking among fo their followers and the people traveling, which you should not be looking for Jesus in other people. You should not be looking for Jesus in Isaiah. Isaiah, lay hands on me. No, no, no. You lay your hands on yourself and you say, I am healed according to Psalms 103.3, according to Mark 16. I can lay hands on the sick. I'm going to lay my hands on myself. Nobody responded on the deliverance map. I'm going to cast the devil out of myself. I'm going to look myself in the mirror and say, every foul spirit, come out of me in Jesus' name. I don't need some man of God. I need God. Is there a place for man of God? Of course. Paul said, I long to be with you that I might lay hands on you and impart spiritual gifts. We know that's biblical, but I'm saying stop relying on them having a relationship with God thinking you do. So the Bible says this, and we're about to close worship team. You guys can play because if you don't play, I'll preach for another 45 minutes. So yeah, just make me rush. Be like, come on, Isaiah, play. The best is when you're preaching and then the worship team gets up without you asking. It's like, oh, pastor sent them. We got to end. I've been there. Me and Jared, you been there? Jared's like, I was there last week. All right. Here's what, here's what happens. They go back. And the Bible says three days later, they find Jesus. Some of you won't search for three minutes. We're going to do an altar call. I know the playoff game. Well, the playoff game, I understand. You can watch it on DVR, record it. You ain't missing that much. It's, again, a bunch of grown men chasing pigskin. You'll be good. You'll be fine. You'll survive if you don't see a, a tackle. You know, you've been getting tackled by the devil all week. It's time to, to tackle him. It's time, to, it's time to fight him. Forget about all the football. You can watch it later. It's not. You're good. You're good. Mary and Joseph, three days. Let me ask you this question. If you've, I'm not saying you have lost God. Only you know. I have no clue if you've lost God or not. If you've lost Jesus, the question is, how long will you search for him? 
Mary and Joseph resolved in their heart, we are not going to stop looking until we find him. When I go in prayer, I pray until I find God. And people say, well, how long should I seek God for? How long do you look for your car keys? How many of you know when you're late to work and you've lost your car keys, you don't sit there and go, well, I guess I'll just have Carvana come pick up my car because I lost the keys and so I'll just sell it. I don't really, I can't, I don't have no keys and I'll just miss work today and I'm going to go sit on the couch and watch TV. Nobody ever stops looking for their car keys. You look for your keys until, that's how we look for God. We don't search for God and say, oh, well, you, Jesus, you had 10 minutes, couldn't find you. I guess we'll try again next week. We spend our lives seeking until we find, knocking until the door is open, asking until we receive. Three days later, watch what happens. Three days later, this is the words that come out of Mary's mouth, and this is the words that come out of many of our mouth when we lose Jesus. He sa they say, Jesus, how could you do this to us? Mary says this, how could you do this to us? Me and your father have been frantically looking for you. Now here's what we have to ask ourselves. When we're mad at God, did Jesus leave Mary and Joseph or did Mary and Joseph leave Jesus? Mary and Joseph left Jesus. Why are you yelling at God that he left you during your divorce? God, where were you when I was in the fourth stage of my cancer? Pastor didn't come visit me. My friends didn't come visit me. And God, you abandoned me in that ICU. God, where were you when I was going through that trauma and that sexual abuse and that ungodly relationship? You didn't show up and save me. You didn't show up and rescue me. God, where were you when I was overdosing on fentanyl on the corner of 5th Street and you were nowhere to be found? And God says, hey, 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 I know you're hurt. I know you've been through a lot, but I want you to know something. I've never left you. I didn't walk away from you. You walked away from me. Whenever I tell God, God, where were you? God responds with the same question. God, where were you when my family was dying and going to hell? And God says, where were you when your family was dying and going to hell? I put my spirit in you. I didn't walk away from you, Isaiah. I, you've walked away from me. And guys, I'll be the first one to respond to today's altar call and say, I've lost Jesus before. I've gone weeks before in my streaming and interview after interview and preaching, sermon, traveling, thinking I'm so cool doing all this stuff. And Jesus is like, hey, um, at any point, are we going to like talk at all? I've had Jesus literally tell me, I don't even know you anymore, Isaiah. I've had Jesus tell me, Isaiah, you're so busy doing all these things for me, you don't even know who I am anymore. Working so hard for the king, you don't even know the king. And God says, Isaiah, I don't care about all the stuff you can do for me. I want you. I want relationship with you. So Mary says, we've been frantically. I want you to see the word here because I'm about to end right here. Mary says, we've been frantically searching for you. In other words, we, when we lose God, we don't search casually. We search frantically. You should not be like this. Uh, well, I mean, I guess. Good word, brother. High five. I'm going to come to the altar. Some of you, I can tell you don't care the way you respond to altar calls. Like... I guess I'll come forward. I mean, I don't really know. I haven't prayed in seven months, but I guess I, I don't know if I've lost him or not. You've lost him. If you haven't prayed in seven months, you've lost Jesus. If you don't spend time in his word, you've lost Jesus. If the word of God doesn't bring any type of excitement to you or desire, you have zero desire, you've lost him. That's you. I don't, you don't have to even ask or pray. If you don't have a prayer life, you don't have Jesus in your life. You can't have a relationship with someone you don't talk to. It's absolutely impossible. First words that come out, and we can get the prayer team to line up. First words that come out of Jesus' mouth. First words in all of scripture. These are the first words out of the mouth of God, and this is in Luke chapter two. He says, why did you even need to search for me? In other words, Jesus was saying, why are you sitting here acting like you don't know where to find me? He says, didn't you know, this is to his parents, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? In other words, we know where to find God. David Wilkerson one day lost the anointing. He was preaching to an arena full of young people that were drug addicted, coming out of homes, and he preached a whole, just missed it. His sermon was off, and he missed it. And he was in his, his RV at the arena he was at, and a group of pastors came to him with tears in their eyes, and they said, Brother Wilkerson, you've lost the anointing. We brought all these drug addicted kids to your service, and you preached about marriage. 
They said there was no oil. There was no anointing. Wilkerson, you lost the anointing. These pastors were crying. They left his, his RV and he cried out to God and said, dear God, I've lost your anointing. I've lost your presence. I need it back. And God said, what, David, you know how to get it back. You know the cost. He said, you know what it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you the same thing it costed you the day you gave your life to God. It's going to cost you everything. See, but we lay everything down to God, and then slowly through the years, we pick idols back up. And then God looks at our life and says, it looks like you have so many other idols, you don't need me. And God leaves our life, and we don't even realize it. And we keep coming to church, and we keep praising at the altar, and we keep singing the songs, and we've lost God, and there's no relationship with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not filling our life because our life is filled with everything else but God. And God today says, you know where to find me. Where is he at? I'll be in my Father's house. This is the place where if you've lost connection and relationship to God, I'm giving you a chance to come up here and say, everyone stand to their feet. Everyone stand to their feet. I'm giving you a chance to say, I've lost that intimate. I'm not talking about a church relationship. I'm not saying if you're an unbeliever, come up here. I am talking to you Christians that know you've lost relationship and intimacy with God. He said, why did you need to search? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? And Jesus, look at this leaves the father's house, leaves the temple to go home and be with imperfect people and go home with Mary and Joseph. And I read that verse and God said, Isaiah, that wasn't the first time that Jesus did that because Jesus left the Father's house, heaven, left the Father's house to come to earth and be with imperfect people. The point of the message is Jesus wants to go home with you. Don't leave him at the celebration. Don't leave him at the church. If you are in this room and you say in 2024, I am going all in for God. I'm going to see the harvest. I'm tired of not having relationship. I'm tired of denying him. I'm tired of not walking in his spirit. I'm tired of not hearing his voice. Jesus said, my sheep they hear and know my voice then I want you to come out of this come out of your chair and come to this altar first service we didn't have time to bring people out like this I want you that's you right now with them yeah people are watching me who cares who cares they're not gonna be there on judgment day I hate to tell you but your wife's not gonna be next to you on judgment day your husband is not gonna be next to you we're gonna pray for you come forward come forward we're gonna pray for you I want you just to begin to pray come forward come forward come forward Squeeze in as tight as you can. We're going to pray for you. And those of you out in the crowd, I want you to wrestle with God. I want you to just say, God, I need your presence in my life. God, I need your anointing in my life. Father, we come before you today, God. Lord, we're so desperate for your presence. No hype, no loud music. God, we're desperate for your presence. God, we're desperate for your anointing. God, we're desperate for your fire. Lord, forgive us for leaving you. God, we know you have not left us, but we've walked away from you for other idols. The entire story of the Bible was men leaving God to go worship idols. And God's saying, come back to me. And today God is echoing that same prophetic message to you. Come back to me. Come back to me. God, we repent of our sin, God. We turn to you, Lord. We need you in our life. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. I want you to pray right now as we end impartation conference. I want you to pray that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit right now. Just put your hands out and ask for God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. If you're not a believer, now's your moment to start turning from your sin. All you're going to say is, Lord, I repent of my sin. God, I want you in my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. God, I believe that you died. I'm ready to lay it all down. God, I'm ready to lay it all down. Come on, if you're an unbeliever, I was an atheist at an altar. I went from being an atheist to a revivalist in one second because I came to an altar and said, God, if you are effing real, I cussed at God. I said, God, if you are real, I'll give you everything. I was an atheist. And God audibly came to me and changed my life, and I've been preaching ever since. Maybe you're an atheist at an altar like I was. All you need to do is say, God, I'll give you everything. God, I want to serve you. God, I want to know you. God, I want to follow you. God, I lay my idols down today. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38, they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent. Guys, we need to repent right now for worshiping the gods of this world, for worshiping pornography, for worshiping lust, for worshiping perversion, for worshiping culture and social media, for bowing down to our iPhone and worshiping the gods of the culture. God, we, we give it up to you, Lord. We don't want any idols in our life. We don't want technology to become our God. 
Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Come on, church, pray. Pray. Don't even worry if no one's laying hands on you. You need to pray right now. No one was laying hands on me when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, they all got filled in Cornelius' house. Nobody laid hands. They all got filled. You can be in the very back of the building right now and get filled with the Holy Spirit. The back is just as powerful as the front. The Holy Ghost is moving. There's people with addictions, with sicknesses. Now's your moment for breakthrough. Every unclean spirit is leaving you today in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit is leaving you in Jesus' name. Satan, get your hands off this church. Satan, get your hands off these people. Satan, your reign of terror is over. It stops now. Jezebel, your power is broken. Your reign of terror is over, Jezebel. We bind every foul spirit and command it into the abyss in Jesus' name. Sickness, you must go. Father, we pray your healing touch, your healing fire, and your healing power just to radiate onto people. Prayer team, make sure you're praying for a couple minutes then going on to someone else. We want to make sure everybody that can gets hands laid on them. God, we need you. Come on, I hear the Lord saying, what idols do you need to lay down today? What idols do you need to lay down today? An idol for you might not be an idol for me. And an idol for me might not be an idol for you. Come on, right now, all over this crowd, what idols do you need to lay down today? The idols of money. The idols of success. Come on. Lord, we lay down social media. We, God, help us overcome this addiction. We lay down vaping. We lay down drinking. We lay down smoking. God's breaking nicotine addiction right now. Some of you are like, I have to vape. You think you're going to die if you don't. That's demonic. That's not God. You will not die if you stop smoking or vaping. God wants to break that smoking addiction off of you today. It's literally killing you. The doctor will tell you you're going to die if you keep smoking and you keep smoking. God wants to break that addiction off of you today. I feel that really strong. God's breaking nicotine addiction. Spirit of suicide, you are broken in Jesus' name. We bind the spirit of suicide in Jesus' name. That voice telling you to take your life is a demon. We bind that demon in Jesus' name. You will live and not die, says the Lord. Father, I pray those with cancer, Lord, that you'd bring healing right now. Lord, that you'd heal cancer in this room. Lord, right now, just touch every person with your Holy Spirit healing power. Healing power of God be released. Cancer has to go. Diabetes has to go. Heart disease has to go. Blood disease has to go. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be healed. Be healed. I need one of my prayer warrior sisters right here. Where are you? I need someone to pray for my sister right here. I need a prayer warrior right here for my sister. One of you leaders, I need you to pray right here for my sister. Right here. She needs freedom. Brother, you can pray for her. She needs freedom right now. That spirit's going to leave you in Jesus' name. That spirit has to go now in Jesus' name. That spirit has to go now in Jesus' name. She's getting freedom right now. Come out of her now. Freedom is in this house. Listen, this is a Holy Ghost filled church. This church, there's freedom for you here at this church. If you have drug addiction, there's spiritual freedom at this church. There's healing at this church. God is healing bodies right now. He's breaking addictions right now. There's many of you that are coming out of a drug addiction and I hear the Lord saying, I'm breaking the power of drug addiction. Listen, this fentanyl crisis has to end. Your next pill could be your last pill. Don't risk it. Don't risk it. Drugs will kill you. The devil wants to drag you down to hell with these drugs. Don't touch them. God can heal you and deliver you right now. Father, I pray drug addiction would be broken right now in Jesus' name. Lord, break the drug addiction off these people, God. Free them, God, from prescription pill addiction. Free them from meth addiction, God. Free them from cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl addiction. Some of you are, are never going to have a withdrawal. Like, well, I'm going to have withdrawals. No, God's going to heal you. God's going to deliver you. No withdrawals. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Oh, we pray, God, fill them with your Holy Ghost. Fill them with your Holy Spirit today, God. Baptize them. This city will be turned upside down, God, by these people. Baptize them in power and fire. Come on, just ask Him to baptize you in power. We need power from on high. 
the church in America, there's a power outage. There's a power outage. We need the power of God back in the church. Come on, church. We need the power back in the church. It's not okay that there's no power at our altars, at our churches. This is a church of power. This is a church of fire. This is a church of healing and deliverance and breakthrough. Marriages are being restored today. And today, we're taking Jesus home with us. Make the commitment. We're not leaving him at the temple. Today, I'm taking Jesus into my Monday. I'm taking Jesus into my Tuesday. Stop leaving Jesus at church. Thank you, Lord. Just continue to pray, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right now, if you're, if you're getting prayer, if you're praying for somebody, you can continue to move on, move, uh, pray with as many people as you can. If you're waiting to be prayed for right now, use your time to sign up to get baptized. See, we don't make a decision to follow Jesus and then not take action. Take action on the decision you made today. There's a code right behind me. Sign up, get baptized, make a decision to follow Jesus. And church, there's two things I wanna share with you. Number one is today, if you have Spanish-speaking family or you speak Spanish or Pastor Marco is preaching, our senior pastor, in Spanish at 1.30, that's in about 45 minutes, he's gonna be preaching in this room in Spanish. And then also this Wednesday, the revival continues this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We're going to be here. Go ahead. I want to say something. I know from YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, all of that. Listen, you need to find a church. All of you that came from my online, I am telling you, I highly recommend this church. If I lived in this area, I would be at this church. And I want to tell you, if you came to hear me preach, you need to get plugged into this church. You need to get involved. You need to start helping serve here. I want to say that because I, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, Isaiah, a lot of people that follow you, they're just kind of, a lot of them are just drifting around. You need to find, yeah, you're spiritually homeless. You need to find a local church. If you're in this area, this is an amazing, beautiful church. I've been preaching here for almost seven years. You need to get plugged in. I just wanted to say that. Amen. Thank, you. thank you, Isaiah. Let's give Isaiah a round of applause. Let's thank God. How many received a word from Jesus today? The revival continues this Wednesday night. We're going to be in this room at 7 p.m. A powerful night of worship, a powerful word. Come expecting to have an encounter with God.